So friends, I've got to be honest. I feel like today's opening statements in Donald Trump's first criminal trial were a bit of a lopsided affair, but in a good way. Let's talk about that because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. So friends, Donald Trump's first criminal trial opened with both a bang and a whimper. And we're gonna talk about both. We're gonna look at some of the prosecution's opening statement, and then we're gonna have a look at some of what the defense attorney said in his opening statement. But as always, let's start with the new reporting. This from The Guardian. Headline, Trump's hush money trial, key takeaways from opening statements. And that article begins, Donald Trump was confronted on Monday with the unsavory details of his alleged attempt to illegally influence the 2016 election by covering up hush money payments to the adult film star Stormy Daniels as the first criminal trial for a former U.S. president got underway in New York. Trump has pleaded not guilty to 34 counts of falsifying business records where the hush money payments were recorded as legal expenses to cover up the affair just weeks before the election. Here are some key takeaways. One, prosecutors immediately focused on the 2016 election. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office sketched out from the start of their opening statements that Trump committed one crime, the falsification of records, in furtherance of a second crime to violate campaign finance laws. The prosecutor, Matthew Colangelo, presented to the jury that Trump's catch-and-kill scheme with the National Enquirer tabloid was entirely geared toward helping the Trump 2016 campaign. Colangelo contended there were three parts to the alleged conspiracy, that the National Enquirer would run positive coverage the National Enquirer would attack Trump's political opponents, and the National Enquirer would act as the eyes and ears for the campaign to detect and suppress negative stories. Quote, this case is about a criminal conspiracy and fraud. The defendant, Donald Trump, orchestrated a criminal scheme to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. Then, He covered up that conspiracy by lying in his New York business records over and over and over again, Colangelo said. Second takeaway, Trump appeared uncomfortable. During much of Colangelo's opening statement, Trump appeared uncomfortable in his seat with his brow furrowed, while the unsavory details of the alleged affair with Daniels and his boasts about grabbing women's you-know-what in the infamous Access Hollywood tape were read out to the jury. Takeaway number three, Trump's lawyers focused on his ignorance. That is a big topic to cover. Where to begin? That's my editorial edition. Back to the article. For the defense opening statement, the Trump lawyer, Todd Blanche's main theme to the jury was that uh, Trump was not involved and unaware about the specifics of the hush money payments because uh, Trump left it all to his former lawyer and fixer, Michael Cohen, to handle. Okay, friends, so let's turn to just a few of the highlights from the opening statement of prosecutor Matthew Colangelo, and I want to go back and start with his opening salvo because I thought it was really well-crafted. This case is about a criminal conspiracy. Trump orchestrated a criminal scheme to corrupt the 2016 presidential election. Then he covered up that criminal conspiracy by lying in his New York business records over and over and over again. 
And here are just a few of the points Prosecutor Colangelo made in his opening statement. Michael Cohen paid $130,000 to an adult film actress named Stormy Daniels to silence her and make sure the public did not learn about a sexual encounter with the defendant, Donald Trump. Cohen made the payment at the direction of the defendant, who paid him back through a series of checks, and they disguised these checks as payments for legal services. Michael Cohen met with Alan Weisselberg, that's Donald Trump's former chief financial officer, and you'll probably recall that Weisselberg is presently serving a prison term at Rikers Island after pleading guilty to multiple counts of perjury. Why? Well, because Alan Weisselberg lied at Donald Trump's last trial, his civil fraud trial, you know, trying to help out his old boss, Donald Trump. So no, Alan Weisselberg will not be making an appearance as a witness at this trial. So Cohen and Weisselberg talked about how Cohen would be paid back because let's face it, the Trump organization couldn't cut Cohen a check with the memo, quote, reimbursement for porn star payoff, close quote. So they agreed to do what? To cook the books and make it look like the repayment was actually income to Michael Cohen. Weisselberg asked Cohen to show him the $130,000 check, and they agreed to repayment of a total of $420,000, and they were saying falsely that it was income. You will see in this trial, said Prosecutor Colangelo, Alan Weisselberg's writings to show how they converted $130,000 to $420,000 to disguise the reimbursement as income. And I love Prosecutor Colangelo's characterization of this scheme. Michael Cohen lays out $130,000 for Donald Trump, and ultimately Donald Trump pays him back $420,000. Here's what Prosecutor Colangelo said about that. He told the jury, you'll see evidence in this trial. The Trump Organization was not in the practice of paying people twice for anything. In fact, it might be the only time that's ever happened. And Colangelo said that was a double lie. And the prosecutor's opening statement went on for about 45 minutes, and there are lots of accounts online. If you want to dig in and sort of read the entirety of the prosecution's opening statement, which I thought was extraordinarily well done. But let's turn to just a little bit of what Donald Trump's defense attorney, Todd Blanche, told the jurors during Donald Trump's opening statement. He said things like, Donald Trump is larger than life, and we will call him President Trump out of respect. He's also a man. He's a husband. He's a father. And just like me. I don't know that I would have told the jurors that I'm just like Donald Trump, and he's just like me. But that's what Todd Blanche said. Then he went on to attack the evidence in what I thought was a curious way. For one, most of what you'll hear about this trial, most of the documents are from 2015, 2016, 2017, years and years ago. In fact, pre-COVID. So let's see. We all know that Donald Trump has done everything he could do to try to delay this trial as, as long as humanly possible. And now his attorney argues, oh, this is an old case. So much delay pre-COVID. I mean, how can anybody be convicted for anything that went on pre-COVID? Curious argument. Todd Blanche continued, so what on earth is a crime? What's a crime? These 34 counts are really just 
34 pieces of paper. And then Todd Blanche actually fell into the trap that had been set for him by prosecutors by arguing the following. President Trump did not pay Mr. Cohen back $130,000. President Trump paid Michael Cohen $420,000. Would a frugal businessman, would a man who pinches pennies, repay a $130,000 debt to the tune of $420,000? Friends, to which I am sure every juror thought to themselves, the prosecution has already explained. The evidence will prove that they didn't want to just write a reimbursement check to Michael Cohen with the memo, the notation, reimbursement for payoff to porn star to try to protect Donald Trump to bury damaging information to gain unfair advantage in the 2016 election. So what they did was they falsified business records. They paid him more to deceive everybody. They paid him a total of $420,000, maybe to keep him in the fold, keep him from flipping. And that was one of the ways they disguised these payments, right? Trying to hide from everybody that in that $420,000, there was $130,000 worth of repaying Michael Cohen for paying out of his own pocket at the direction of and for the benefit of Donald Trump. And the defense fell right into the trap. $420,000 isn't $130,000. Therefore, Michael Cohen didn't make the hush money payments. I'm sure all 12 jurors and the six alternates were thinking to themselves, Wait a minute, sport. We already know, courtesy of the prosecution's opening, that that was part of the corrupt scheme. Todd Blanche continued. He said, I have a spoiler alert. There's nothing wrong with trying to influence an election. It's called democracy. So democracy looks like paying hush money to playmates and porn stars, violating New York state law by falsifying business records to cover up the true nature of those payments, thereby giving your campaign an enormous in-kind contribution, violating campaign finance laws, and deceiving the American voters, right? trying to gain unfair and unlawful advantage. In a presidential election, Todd Blanche calls that democracy. I call that criminal. And I'm betting the jurors will too. Let me just take on one other thing that Todd Blanche said in his opening statement. I'm going to say something else about her Stormy Daniels testimony. And this is important. It doesn't matter. Her testimony, while salacious, does not matter matter. Interesting that a defense attorney would tell the jurors that some of the deeply damaging, incriminating evidence they will hear from Stormy Daniels does not matter. Pay no attention to the man or woman or evidence behind the curtain because the evidence that incriminates my client does not matter, and I urge you to just disregard it. This is some of what the jurors heard from Donald Trump's defense attorney in opening statements. And that's why I say, now yes, I've only read select portions of the prosecutor's opening, of the defense opening. Please feel free to go online, read all of the accounts start to finish. Um, but when I read through the reporting of what those two attorneys told those jurors in that wooden box in that Manhattan courtroom today about the crimes and defenses that Donald Trump would be offering, it was a lopsided affair. 
But it was a lopsided affair in a good way because accountability spoke a whole lot louder in that Manhattan courtroom today than did the distractions and the diversions and attorneys who say, this, what Donald Trump did, is what our democracy looks like, is what our democracy is all about. Boy, that's shameful. That's shameful. But I have faith in those jurors. And we're going to keep up on every day of the, this trial. I will try to bring you some of the highlights. As you may know, David Pecker, the head of AMI, uh, American Media Incorporated, which ran the National Enquirer, started testifying today. He only got a few minutes into his testimony and talked about how his particular brand of journalism was paid for journalism. They bought stories. Um, I suspect tomorrow when David Pecker really lays out how he was part of this conspiracy. Now, you may recall he was um, providing information under what's called a non-prosecution agreement. So he wasn't prosecuted for being part of this conspiracy, but you can bet he's going to testify about it tomorrow. And I believe tomorrow will again be a good day for accountability and justice. And justice matters. Day one, friends, big day one, big step on the road to accountability. And as I've said before, a step on the road to fulfilling the long dormant American promise that no one is above the law, not even a former president. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned. And I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.